Taste my game fix. Hello and welcome to episode 66 of Taste My Game Face. I am your host, Zizi Adiemo, joined today by Joe Knight. Hello. Wayne James. Hello. And Daniel Slauson. Hello. So, um, we have, well, we've all, we all saw it during the Game Awards we've, and uh, a few of us have had a little look again at the new Kojima game, um, Ko- Kojima Studios game trailer um, for Death Stranding. So that was weird, right? Yeah, man. I'm pretty <laughs> excited. Like, I, I, it's been a while since I've seen such, I don't know, like, bonkers concepts put together, but with such a real eye towards absolute desperate dread. <laughs> <laughs> like, it really nails its concept of being terrifying. Yeah. Yeah, but what? But what the hell else is it? <laughs> like, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I've... I'm kind of all about it, and especially like you know. He hasn't shown his hand at a bit where there's the girl who wears a bikini yet, so I can be excited mm-hmm. about it. The uh, yeah, you no. Know? The thing about Death Stranding to me, it feels like is it's like the epitome. Kojima, as a man who is nothing but influenced by film and the things he likes, and outwardly just loves things quite often, like it's the culmination of all those things. Like it's it's a bit of the thing. He's blatantly watched Stranger Things in the time since he put the first trailer out with this trailer, with the music and some of the stuff going on. Um, it's like Aliens. And it's just like all these things like culminated together in some bizarre, almost like Lovecraftian dread horror sort of <laughs> layer on top of it. And I just think that's a, a weird thing. Am I the only person then that just saw like... A, a, a kind of video gamed up scene from the third Harry Potter. Uh, <laughs> like I mean, that was that was just like Dementors flying about, right? And, oh, like the bit where the bit people where... souls out and <laughs> <laughs> really, that's where you went. <laughs> the, <laughs> the bit where Ron like, tries to like cut his own heart out because like he can't, yeah, 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 he exactly. can't deal with the yeah, idea I... of what might happen to him. It was. I mean, that was a little bit harrowing. I thought for children, actually, in the third film, uh, particularly given the target audience. But yeah, I think that Kojima really carried that off and brought across the uh, mm. true feeling of dread that I got from that film. It did remind yeah. me of the twist where the camera goes down Harry's throat, and you realise Voldemort has been living inside his throat the whole time. <laughs> in fairness, isn't that broadly what actually happens? <laughs> it is something I mean, like that. It's like throat, it's like he's in like, you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, it's it's. Um, sorry if we're doing Harry Potter spoilers for anyone. <laughs> <by the way. laughs> um, <laughs> no, um, so I mean, opinions for me, it's like, I mean, like, yeah, it was batshit mental, and also a really gripping watch actually. But mm. I do feel like I've seen the trailer for a film and not for a game. I have absolutely no idea what the game is. Or, mm. or what the film would be even like okay so hold on we need to, we need to give a little bit of a rundown of what we actually saw in case people haven't seen the trailer we definitely recommend that you do because it is very very hard to describe yeah. so um but but joe you've had a go at describing already right okay so, yeah in right. you go mate <laughs> <laughs> all right so norman norman readers from the walking dead uh wakes up in uh in a in a sort of desert a kind of like a kind of gray desert uh, it reminds me of the of moon, him. the surface of the moon. Yeah, it, yeah, it's it kind reminds of me. Alien, um, like, it, re- it reminds me of like kind of overcast days, like uh, walking along by by the side of the Thames back when uh, Greenwich was all um, kind of run down dockyards and the like, and was all derelict. <laughs> it just, it's it's exactly that. It's an incredibly specific <laughs> reference. Can we, get any buildings? can we get any buildings? <laughs> can we get any closer to home with this? It's like it's like Z's back garden. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately not. <laughs> no, I don't know. But... <laughs> so anyway, in, in front of him, uh, are they're they're all in this kind of science garb. They're they're dressed up in with these kind of difficult to understand bits of machinery hanging off them. Um, and two of his uh, colleagues uh, are over by a t- overturned car. One of them's trapped underneath, and desperately, uh, the other scientist is trying to pull him out from underneath. Then all of a sudden, there's some 
spooky kind of noises and the, the the air seems to kind of change and Norman Reedus tells them all to shut up and they can't breathe and then these footprints kind of glide over them like tapping on the side of the car whilst they stay completely still a bit like you know the T-Rex from uh, you know Jurassic Park it's you a, know this, don't move <laughs> you just gotta stand there he sees movement <laughs> it's at this point that we do get a little bit of a view into what some of their science equipment is as well right because they've got these little things on their back that are sort of twinkling like weird things Chirping. they're like desperately desperately trying to keep silent and they've got yeah. these weird like things that are going absolutely batshit in the direction of the it's footprints like weird little flappy umbrella robot sunflower things that are just like flapping it like <laughs> when they feel when they feel dread <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's their it's their canaries uh, I, so, I bet that's what they're called as well it's, it's like so motion detector from is... aliens <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so we, we've got these alien ghosts that are kind of about and you know i'm always about some sort of alien ghost two of my favorite things put them together <laughs> did you like the final fantasy movie then <laughs> oh, we, we, well, which spirits within? Yeah, yeah, there were some good alien ghosts. In that. <laughs> ghosts of Mars. That's Your... another film. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, then uh, the guy who's pinned under the car starts getting dragged away by some sort of black ooze, with all hands kind of writhing out of it, and um, his mate pulls out a pistol and shoots him in the head because obviously that's better hmm. than whatever is about to happen to that man. Then this dude turns up on top of the car who's also got an umbrella sunflower on him, but he's dressed like something from Final Fantasy with like a cloak of... and he kind of hovers about a bit. Like, um, And then he looks at one of them and points and then this sack on the front of the man, there's a baby now in it that gets birthed. <laughs> Why are you still with me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Could Wait, you imagine is, the fucking elevator point, pitch for this fucking bad is boy? It, is, it, is it at this point that the baby does a little forward roll as well? Yeah, yeah, it does a little, it does a little <laughs> flip round. Um, then, uh, then our man with the babbly, he he starts getting sucked upwards into the sky. He throws the the baby off of him after firing shots at nothing. Um, and as Dan so beautifully put it. Rather than being sucked to whatever doom it is, he would rather kill himself. You know, that's going to be better. So he starts stabbing himself in the chest as he's getting dragged into the sky. He's lost the gun at this point because, yeah. you know, you get dragged up into the yeah. sky suddenly. That's going to go in a different direction. Yeah. So, yeah, um, Norman Reedus is left with this baby. Then it, this guy gets sucked into the head of some sort of giant shadow homunculus atlas man. This thing is like 50 stories tall as well. Yeah. That, that just appeared. We <laughs> weren't his, ready for that. His head opens up like the final boss from Half-Life 1. <laughs> and then he gets sucked into it and then it explodes. What's, it, what's his name? Nel- Nelithotep. I have no idea. It's best, his name best, is. best yeah, but, if we all forget about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but what, the best part of Half-Life? Um, <laughs> Um, so yeah, then his head explodes. Then Norman Reedus is now under the sea, and there's all sorts of like weird microorganisms cri- cribbling all over him. But they're you know like kind of fish sized, and they're all wibbling about all over the place, <laughs> and everything is very strange. I-, I can't remember if there was a whale. If I'm just inception, no, there was a whale. Yeah, because Hideo Kojima loves whales, so I assumed mm. that there was a whale. So you know you got a little bit of <laughs> going on, and then you know Norman Reedus wakes up vomits onto the ground some black oil and then it's and then there are five dudes hanging out everyone's hey, got strands you missed like, before, before he wakes up though before he wakes up oh sorry i missed the bit <laughs> there's so much here i know <laughs> tell us what <laughs> yeah, happens yeah, yeah. So, so, so before he wakes up the camera sort of zooms into his face and then into his mouth and then down his esophagus and zooms in on the baby that we saw um, thrown to the floor earlier inside some kind of weird sack thing um, and then the baby is sucking its th- thumb it then withdraws said thumb gives a thumbs up to the camera uh, the camera zooms out back the way it came but now it's over this dude who is you know on the floor in a slightly sunnier desert so but not underwater anymore so he's he not underwater. In. no 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 he, yeah exactly so he gasps and spits out oil bugs <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah and they scuttle off and then there's f- over the camera, and then there's five dudes hanging out in the sky, looking very ominous around a giant around crater. Because we zoomed out at this point, and there you go. And then it says Death Stranding trailer. 
<laughs> and uh, and we all go, what the fuck was that? <laughs> yeah, I'm quite excited. I so actually, here's here's the whole deal with this with this new Kojima thing that that I have going on, right? Metal Gear Solid is such a deep hole to go down, and I did not get on that train early enough that by the time I kind of was thinking about considering getting involved, it was just too much of a Marley beast to tackle. Mm. But Kojima's doing something new now, so I get to actually be there from the start of this one. So I, having an understanding of his particular insane approach and a brilliant approach to video games, I'm really excited about being able to have that without having so so much to have to kind of get stuck into and also he seems to keep putting my favorite actors in it so yeah it's um i think it's going to be a winner i have no Mm. idea what it is at this point um and i'm not really trying to understand it because i feel like i should just wait till i can actually have the game and try and maybe try and piece it together then or just experience the weird atmosphere that he builds. But it's, it's interesting because mm. for me it evokes quite a lot of that kind of, you know, when you read sci-fi, you know, like if you if you read like um, Roadside Picnic or something, there's all these parts where you're trying to explain a thing that is kind of beyond concept. Yeah. You know, and I think that that trailer really does a good job of visually representing uh, those kind of science, that, high science fiction elements. I think it was it was a question that I asked when we were talking about Destiny before, um, which is that there's that feeling in a lot of sci-fi of having something that's so kind of powerful and unknowable in its kind of weird science kind yeah, of that machinations. It supernatural. That, yeah, that it, and it's... And it kind of stumbles into the Lovecraftian uh, something that's unknowably terrifying. But maybe it's not mm. that it's terrifying, just that it's it's something that's based on technology that we don't have an understanding for. And whatever kind of feeling of awe and wonder, like those those books managed to imbue in that, like that was definitely present in that trailer. That was definitely yeah. present. The, so I'll have a bit of that. The thing it reminds me of most, and I suppose this is... It reminds me most of Bloodborne. And Ooh, yeah, that's a good show actually. Uh Bloodborne seemingly is a gothic horror game at the start of Bloodborne. And the Bloodborne goes very weird as it goes on. <clears throat> um and there's a lot of this and actually Dark Souls has done it as well. Dark Souls the horror side of Dark Souls and Bloodborne play a lot with this idea of the abyss and the deep and this unknowing sort of presence and like it just plays into that so much and in Bloodborne in particular there is a lot of kind of marine influence in some of that aspect of it um and having watched an episode of Planet Earth 2 recently where they go into like the deep depths of the ocean like you see some stuff there and you're like that's some weird shit that is what this like the stuff that these things have been representing as like these horrifying like creatures for so many years, like that is just what lives there. And like, there's just like a pool of denser liquid that is like a lake at the bottom of the ocean and things go in there. And if they spend too long in there, they go mad. And it's, it's like impossible to understand. Like, and it's, it's something that is conceptually so bizarre that we don't get it, but it's like, it's, I don't know. I get that vibe so heavily, like from, from this and like that if you haven't seen that episode of planet earth 2 it just it's like horrifying like it's just so creepy that that kind of stuff can exist in a cool way in an awesome like yeah nature rules sort of thing yeah, but I, yeah it's... I, I wholeheartedly agree i've also seen that episode of planet earth and toxic lakes that are under the sea <laughs> is, is definitely it's just a thing like like seeing a lake at the bottom of the ocean is like you just You're can't just like, even comprehend fuck? it <laughs> so so I've this 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 is something that I saw in nature documentaries a really really long time ago and it was the weirdest thing then as well. I haven't seen this new um, season of plan uh, of um, Blue Planet. Blue Planet. Oh, sorry, Blue Planet. Um, yeah, I got it wrong. Yeah. But but when when I saw that originally, the thing that I thought was, wait, SpongeBob SquarePants, where there's an ocean at the bottom of the ocean, that really exists. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Um, yeah, the bit, something the bit unknowably they don't terrifying. <laughs> SpongeBob SquarePants. <laughs> the so bit they I don't guess... show you is when SpongeBob spends too long in there. That, that already happened. 
Oh, did yeah, yeah, clearly, <laughs> does that's, he? That's does the, he that's go mad? The horror bad story. The back story. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'd like, I guess I'm the only person around the table in the guy wasn't particularly sold on the video game element, right? I mean, it looks like such a wonderful idea, like conceptually, mm. story wise. I suppose um, we're putting the. F- we're putting the faith in that, I suppose, because they just haven't shown us enough of that. So Yeah, and Metal we're, we're... Gear Solid 5 was the best playing of a video game that I'd had in years. Ever. Like the the, the <laughs> feel of it was just phenomenal. You just play it because you just wanted that great control, which is so mad because he's come from... Do you remember Crabans that you used to have to play Metal Gear games with? <laughs> you know, like, it's ridiculous, but he's really tried hard to bring that together, and I'm hoping... I mean, if you, if they just template that onto it, I will be over the yeah. moon. Yeah, no, nothing nothing plays as no third person action game plays as well as Metal Gear Solid Five. Man, I should probably have played it, shouldn't I? Oh well, I wait for this one. <laughs> um, all right, so um, so obviously we're quite excited about um, the possibility of a new Kojima Productions game. Um, but Dan, you've had the opportunity to play a game that you've been like quite excited about for a little mm. while. Um, yeah. So tell us, how was the, was it the Monster Hunter beta? Yeah, that's right. Uh, they did a like a five-day beta or something last weekend. Uh, and this is for Monster Hunter World, which is the new console, PS4, PC, lovely hd version uh which everybody's been waiting for for so long and this was a this was a three hunt uh sort of little demo so you had you could hunt three different monsters of increasing difficulty across two different locations um and it's a real it was a real good way to see how they are doing things differently in this game how the new power of these consoles can afford them to fully realize some of the ideas they may have had prior. Um, one of the major differences Monster Hunter previously was sort of zoned. So you'd go to these, uh, you'd go to the forest, but then the forest would be made up of eight sort of little arena zones. You'd have the bit in the under the canopy, you'd have the bit out on the cliffside, you'd have the bit in the cave, that kind of thing. Whereas this game, I spent half my time lost. Um, I start the... So the, the the hunts they have you do are relatively easy to kind of get into. You pick a weapon, you equip your guy, you run in and you start figuring out where the monster is. You have a fight, you follow it, you have more of a fight. But across these two levels, there are two additional monsters just living. They're just hanging out. Um, that They aren't your target to hunt for this level. Um, and you don't have to find them unless you actually go looking for them. But I went through the three main ones and I was like, oh, I, I know Monster Hunter. I'm going to go try and beat that really hard one on that first level, which I never managed to do. It just completely whooped me every time and I didn't have enough time. <laughs> See, because Monster Hunter gives you time limits. So I, you only have 20 minutes and I just couldn't be in the time limit. But the, so that, that, like having these monsters just hanging out there and having all of these areas which are no longer separate areas, they are just part of like a mini open world, I suppose. Um, it's just really awesome. And like, you can be fighting one monster and like you'll chase it through, like it'll get injured or something and it'll run through into the cave. You'll chase it into the cave. The other monster will be hanging out there. It'll then, they'll start having a fight. There'll be some little scrub guys who also start trying to join in. The big one that you're hunting or something will absolutely murder that other one. It'll just like pick it up in its mouth and throw it away. And it'll run off. <laughs> and then... <clears throat> and just the interactions with the environment seem really, really awesome. So I was fighting one quite high up in this sort of ancient tree. And it hit me. Like, it like whipped me with its tail pretty hard. And I just got thrown off the tree. Like, and I fell four floors or something. Down into the into the the trunk of this tree. And then it, and then it flew down to get me. <laughs> so I was down there on the floor trying to pick myself back up again and then this thing just swoops down and comes like comes after me. Uh and this is that's just something that's never been possible before in the setup they've had. Uh and it's it's really interesting to see the different environments. The two they had in the demo were a kind of forest, an ancient sort of foresty environment, and then another one was a desert. And I didn't play the desert one very much, but the other areas they've shown are really 
bizarre. They've gone they like forest and desert are quite classical areas for the Monster Hunter games, but the the other levels they've shown that are going to be in this game, one of them's called the Coral Highlands, which kind of goes off what we were talking about with Death Stranding. It's this coral reef that is no longer underwater, and the stuff that lives here is like more insect more insectoid and it's it's all a bit weird there's like this weird furry bat which like inflates it's the rough of its neck in order to get air um and then the other one is like some like elephant graveyard poisoned decaying forest where just there's like corpses and things and it's like all a nasty in the valley of the winds yeah it, like like the woods and that yeah it very and so they they do it's really cool to see them picking up where they where they left off like being like this is what we know and do then these, re reimagining that do these environments feel like m- more more kind of fantastical than they have done before or is it just that they feel more complete than they have done before no they f- they feel much more grand so there's a lot more verticality buzzword but um <laughs> In the other games, like it was, it really was. You might, you know, in one area, you might climb up a really big cliff and then go through the load area to get to the next area. And so you'll be on a mountain bit in that new area you've gone to. Um, or, you know, there might be, there might be a ledge halfway across the, the arena you're in so that, you know, there's a higher bit and a lower bit. You know, things like that. Nothing too much. Whereas this is, you know, there's a, Layers there's a upon layers. there's a twenty twenty story tree in the middle of this area. You start off in one of these low plains. You can go around to the edge to find the sort of coastal part. Um, you can run through the caves. You can go down into the caves where there is like there are like glowing moss clumps which you can use to like you can pick them up and then throw them and they'll u- used for lighting areas. Um, or you can like kind of go deeper into the woodland. Or you can climb up the giant, the giant tree, and at the top is is then where this sort of the one of the, the classic Rathalos monster, uh, which is like a, a red dragon sort of thing, lives up there. Um, and it's just really awesome. And like in one of the trailers they showed, there was one of the gameplay demos they showed a while ago it, that was fighting that monster, and it like breaks down this this wall where there's a whole load of water like stored up at the top of this tree. And then it causes this like huge waterfall, which washes you and the monster off. And that happens to be quite a few times because like it's there, and it, you've if you're fighting that thing up there, you've pissed it off. And then so it just starts like swinging around and breathing fire, and it'll just end up destroying this and like knocking itself off a cliff. So it's not that it's like a um, kind of pre cooked, like almost little cutsceney thing. It's that um, if if things do happen to go in that direction then yeah. the environment will end up be, uh, coming into play as well because yeah. i like i remember that was the conversation that we had after seeing this bit this particular mm. bit of gameplay before it was is that a kind of scripted event or mm. is that something that's just part of the dynamism of the level and you're saying that it is part of the dynamism of yeah. the level yeah definitely like so i mean it is obviously it is a preset thing so you know if you break this wall it will unleash water which will wash off this thing but that can only happen once. You can only break that wall once. And that wall can be broken in a number of ways. So, you know, you can put a bomb there and blow it up yourself. But the the way it happened mostly for me was I was ended up getting fighting near it and the monster itself would end up destroying it because it was trying to attack me and got the wall. Um and yeah, it just feels it feels a lot more alive than the other games. Like the other games you fought so many of these monsters and they were so, you know, so like interestingly designed they had all these all this effort put into the way they interact with their environment but you never had the monsters interacting with each other Mm -hmm. um yeah go ahead um with the like the idea of what what i'm getting a feel for is that effectively they're like this is effectively sort of like game hunting but with giant things is, it, yeah. is there any sort of additional conceit behind it or is it literally there are big things you want their head on your wall go for it mostly it's mostly that so essentially i think that it, there is a plot in this game which i'm not 100 percent sure where they're going with it like I, it seems like they're putting quite a lot of effort into it they've got some like cool like old hunter looking characters being thrown in there like in the more recent trailers but when you say old hunter looking are we talking full van pelt here uh, I like one of the ones they showed was like think Norsica 
like some of the old guys in Nausicaa wearing these like masks and goggles and like this old like gun wielding like huge cannon wielding like old woman character like in the woodland like just jumping down and like you know that's great this yeah so <laughs> <laughs> um, wait do you end up looking like that as well you can look however you want see yes like, but can i look like someone from valley of the winters <laughs> yeah probably yeah <laughs> um the um yeah but the main conceit of it is you know you are a tribe in this world and there are big nasty monsters out there and you are tasked with hunting them because that's what you do. And so you go and hunt them and, you know, back in town, they carve it up, you know, they, they take your resources. And like in the old games, they always had quite nice little intro CG cutscenes where they'd kind of show, they'd show the arc, they'd show the hunt, and then they'd show, you know, going back to the town and handing in your, your, your sort of parts of the monster that you've, you found, you know, a bit of, a good dragon piece of like dragon scale or something and then it show like the blacksmith like crafting that into armor so it's always set up as if it's you are a small tribe in the area and monsters are threatening you know these monsters are damaging to your populate your civilization so you need to go and hunt them f- so we can study them and so we can you know survive essentially it's how they set it up it is a bit weird because it is just kind of like, oh yeah, just go and kill all these things, live in their lives. But you know, they're big dragons, and you can make really cool big dragon armor. Yeah, so <laughs> never like them. <laughs> I don't know. So, so this has been the first beer, and it sounds like you've had loads of fun. And I think mm. I want to be involved as well. So, when can I have a go at this, Dan? You can have a go next weekend because they've yeah. annu- like surprisingly this wasn't announced prior to this week they announced so they had the the beta last weekend which was just for ps plus subscribers and then next weekend they're doing the same beta again but it's open to all ps4 players not pc yet um presumably just a stress test and also probably just because they got a lot of good feedback and a lot of good exposure um so they want to do more of that um and i that sounds good for me because it gives me chance to like practice um and you know try my hand at beating these harder monsters again the and teach us how to play <laughs> yeah yeah the uh, the cool <laughs> thing they have in the in the demo as well is they have a training room and this is something that monster hunter has never really had before so um you can go into the training room and it's there's like barrels and trees that you can target and attack um so you can pick your weapon and it'll give you like combos on screen like it would in a fighting game so it'd be like you can press this it'll show you the string of of moves you do as you do them but then also like it gives you some suggestions of like certain combos you can do with the different weapons um which is really really awesome because i uh you know i primarily played the one on psp the last uh, the last ones on psp and i stuck quite heavily to one weapon which is kind of like a big a big katana-esque weapon it's called the longsword um and since then they've introduced new weapons that i hadn't really had a chance to play with and uh, I never really, I never really got into the patterns of the other weapons that are, that were available at that point in time. So having this training room where you can just walk up to the to the equipment box, change your equipment, change your weapon, and then go and have a go on these sort of this number of different targets and try out your combos is a really really good way to learn. And I picked up something. So first of all, I picked up the longsword again, gave that a go. A lot of the similar combos I was used to were there, so that was nice. I could play again, but. I did also play the demo. I played a demo uh, a month ago or something at uh, EGX in Birmingham. And I remember doing that and I could use all the moves I was used to, but I couldn't figure out any of these new ones. I'd seen these videos of these new moves um, and I couldn't figure out how to do them. But so going into this training room, I, you know, I realized, ah, okay, if I do what I was doing before, but I hold back on the direction stick, I can do a different move. And Mm -hmm. it's really cool to see that kind of extra layer of, complexity it reminds me of um in dark souls 3 they introduced something called weapon arts um which were a way to expend your magic points essentially but you would do that in you would do it into in order to uh, execute a new move for your weapon maybe so that you not only magic users would benefit from that that stat was kind of what it did but it also allowed that weapons to have quite drastic uh special moves um and this game kind of has that uh monster Hunter definitely has that vibe so like it these are the weapons that i was used to but now they've got an extra layer of of 
fun. <laughs> um, and then I picked up a new weapon. It's something called the Charge Blade. And this is something that's been in the last few Monster Hunter games, I think, but it's not something I've really had a chance to play with. And this thing is like, okay, so you know, you can, you know, you can chain combos together, but we're going to, we're going to task you with keeping track of a few more things with this one. So what the Charge Blade is, is a sword and shield. And as you attack with the sword... Wait, can I can I just pause you for a moment, Dan? Because yeah, there's something yeah. that I'm not quite aware of here, which is he's what the what the combat's like on a little bit more of a basic level. Yeah, yeah, like, okay, is yeah. it is it kind of more kind of deliberate, um, like Dark Souls, or is it something that's a li- little bit more kind of fast paced? It's like Dark Souls. Okay, okay, it, it's that, very that's much all like I Dark, needed. Like, like, like when I came to Dark Souls after having played Monster Hunter, I've tried to convince people who I know like Monster Hunter to play Dark Souls because I compare the two. Mm-hmm. And similarly, going the other way, I'm trying to convince people to play Monster Hunter because I because I'm like, oh, it's like Dark Souls. Um, It's very much, it doesn't really have, well, historically, you'd never really used the lock on. So kind of quite different to to Dark Souls in that way. But it is, your moves are very, you know, if you press triangle, that move is then going to take that set amount of time to complete. Um, And then you can do combos off of that. So it's very much like Dark Souls in that way. Your moves will take a set amount of time. So you have to you have to balance the time it takes to do the attack and the stamina it might use against your ability to dodge incoming attacks, which are also telegraphed in that same deliberate way so that you can read the enemies and time your combat accordingly. Does that explain? Yes, quite yeah. thoroughly as well. Okay, cool. Um, so the so, charge blade. Yeah, and so the charge blade is a sword and shield typically, which is one of the... That's like the start weapon that you that you are introduced with and so in its normal form the charge blade acts quite similarly uh you have you have a shield in one arm you can block blocking isn't something that is used with most weapons in monster hunter it's only really this which is i think why it's the starting weapon um and it's quite quick You, you know your sword attacks quite quick it's quite a short sword and so as you attack your sword charges up and it starts to glow uh and if you let it get too charged you'll stop being able to really do much damage with it and so what you do is you un you discharge it into your shield and that then power that and that like loads your shield with a certain number of like think of them like bullets like it's a certain number of charges and then what you can do is you can you can essentially bloodborne switch weapon click your sword into the shield and extend it into an axe where the shield is now the top of the axe and this is a much slower weapon it uh, but you can discharge. You can then use the charges you've given it to do powerful discharge attacks, which can grant an element to your weapon, or you know just make it do more damage or something like that. Um, Anyone else seeing Squall's Gunblade here? <laughs> I don't know, man. I'm thinking it sounds pretty badass. Like... Is... <laughs> there's stuff I'm not saying. There's anything wrong <laughs> no, with no, the Gunblade. It... I mean, like... everything's wrong with it. Is like it is like it's not with Squall, but Jesus, it is like that. And so, like this, this weapon inherently has more complexity because, like, you have to keep track of how charged you are and how discharged you are, because otherwise, you're gonna, you know, you could be using these charges to do more damage. And if you let your sword get too charged, it's gonna be not be very useful but charging is an animation in itself so you have to know when you have to make sure you have an opportunity to do that um but then there's this so whereas the other weapons are quite simple in their their sort of standard use and then their complex use this that's just this one standard use the the, it has additional complex use (laughs) where you can where you can then cancel attacks you can cancel your charged attacks mid attack in order to not spend the discharge but to release it into the shield as a whole so that it powers up your actual blocking ability in the shield so you've no longer loaded it with the bullets you've essentially used one of the bullets on your shield in order to power it up and then you can do it and then you can do additional stuff to then (laughs) transfer that charge from the shield to your sword and then so you have a charged sword um, and this is one weapon. That's one of the fourteen weapons. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and this is and I... that is that is one variant. So so all the weapons, any weapon of a sing of a one of the fourteen types will control the same. But the the effects you will get from the charging or the the effects you'll be able to do to enemies will be different. So you might get some poison weapons. You might get electric weapons. The one I was using in this case 
the actual benefit you got from charging it in this way was that you did higher impact damage and impact damage is used to if you attack monsters heads with impact damage you'll concuss them and they'll maybe they'll fall over or they'll become stunned for an amount of time so i guess for for people that are listening that aren't familiar <laughs> with monster hunter like i think the the whole kind of additional layers of complexity here might sound like they're quite overwhelming but i think yeah. you've kind of got you've got games that if they if they last as long as Mon- monster hunter is supposed to it's about mastery of the game and the more things that you have to mm-hmm. master like the more you get out of it and yeah. it is it's it's a game that doesn't have depth in story i mean mm-hmm. as you've explained already there's not much to that story so instead it tries to offer that depth it tries to offer that depth in in terms of gameplay so yeah listening to this now normally if you told me something like this about a game i'd be like oh my god how the <laughs> hell am i ever going to deal with this but i'm actually i'm listening to this and it's and it sounds great it's it's mm. actually really exciting me even more about the game so mm. i do have a question though and that yep. question is do you marry yourself to a weapon like early on or do you just build them as you go and flip and change between so, them i definitely historically have married myself to a weapon so i almost exclusively used the longsword in the previous games that I played. Um, I don't think you have to. And the good thing about this game is not only can you... (laughs) I think it has more in place so you can dismantle upgraded weapons. So the idea of this game, the way you progress is you upgrade. There are no levels in Monster Hunter. You, You go out, you hunt, you get parts from the monsters. You then use those parts to build better armor and upgrade your weapons so like a loot system so like a loot system yeah and quite often there'll be upgrade trees for weapons so you have to go from this weapon to the next one you'll then maybe have two options in which to increase that next one um uh but you have to pick one um i think this game is much more in compared to previous games it's much more free in telling you those progression trees so you can kind of look ahead i think so you'll know how you're developing your weapon and where you want it to go. And I think it's I think it has a you know, not a free, you know, you will lose in overall by doing this, but I think you can revert to previous versions of weapons so that you can go down the different trees if you want to do that. That's only in one weapon tree. I'm not sure what they have for dismantling to get parts back. Because obviously the the problem you have is if you invest your parts in one weapon for a long time you're not going to have any of those parts to spend on the other weapons um so there definitely is that problem i don't know how there i don't know if there is much in the way to encourage uh playing with the different weapons the training room definitely helps because the reason i would never have gone to different weapons and i did occasionally swap to something like the sword and shield because it was something i'd used before and i you know i could quickly get parts together in those higher rank in the higher rank quest so that i could upgrade a good a half decent one to use but the problem is is if you don't know the weapons and you're trying to do these higher level quests it's quite difficult to get into it's quite you know you're not going to be as useful you know you're not going to be able to tackle these harder quests because you don't know the weapons properly but i think the training room is a really good way of overcoming that so i'd hardly use the charge way before i had uh recently got a copy of monster Hunter generations which i'd given given a little bit of time to but only doing the very early game stuff and so i had used the charge blade a little bit in that but really, it was playing for 20 minutes in that training room. Uh, I was able to learn that. And the first and only time I, you know, the first time I went against the hardest of the three monsters here, I used that weapon after have it, after just having done the training room with it. And I was able to, you know, chain together some stuff and be able to beat that monster the first time. Um, and obviously, I do have the, the pre-knowledge of how to generally play the game. But I think the training room really helps. It allows you to kind of get used to it it's i mean it's like a fighting game character really the the different weapons are essentially the different classes in the game so uh you won't be necessarily comfortable with a different class or a different character in a fighting game but you the training room is a really beneficial addition to this game in order to let you try that out yeah i think it um i think it's often like a good thing to have in different games um i think I mean, when it comes to um, kind of anything that's competitive, it's always nice to have an arena where you can really work out how things work in mm-hmm. some detail. And I mean, with a game like this, that's so much based on the gameplay in comparison to like kind of finding a way through narrative, like having that space for practice is really good. But even in um, 
something like the Banner Saga, they have that really nice thing of the fact that whenever you're in camp, um, so you, you're not progressing the story, you can mm-hmm. actually just have training fights and that really can make the difference in the harder difficulties, just having have had the space to uh, practice a few different strategies and things like that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, the other good thing that's going to be in the main game for this is um, typically with Monster Hunter, you would... Um, you'd go on out you'd go out on a hunt and you'd have say 50 minutes for the hunt and you can finish the hunt in that in that time and in this demo it's 20 minutes for these for these different hunts which is why it's i found it quite difficult to beat some of these harder monsters i've seen some people online do all three of the monsters present in a given area within the time limit which is just ridiculous but um they haven't ever had like a free roam of the environments before and to be honest they haven't really had much calls for it um, for resource gathering they did have some like resource gathering quests where it's like oh go collect 10 mushrooms but like the game was really really bad for that before um collecting resources is much quicker in this game and they have free roam um versions of going out to the the different environments in the game so you can just go to the ancient forest on a free roam and you can go and just collect any resources that you you think you may want in particular and you can go and kill the monsters that you know reside in that ancient forest area. And I think that's actually going to be a really good, a really beneficial thing for the game because in my time playing the beta, I felt quite rushed trying to beat these (coughs) monsters. So I wasn't taking the time to soak in the environment very much. But obviously if I have that chance to go in uh, without a time limit in the free roam mode, I can take that time to sort of, you know, learn my way around, stroll, have a look at you know what typical where the monsters typically reside and get used to my environment that way and i think that's going to be a a really uh a really good uh thing to get comfy with the game so when you set out on a hunt do, do you, are these kind of like locked instances where you and your party or like you know your co-op companions you'll go out into like an instance of it or is it like a kind of like much more of an mmo kind of uh, are there people moving around that aren't in your party ever? No, it's locked instances. They In the previous games, I haven't seen how they're doing it in this game. The town in general does seem a lot more uh, sprawling and vibrant in this game, but that's not in the demo. But uh, there was always something called like the Guild Hall, and this is essentially like the, it's like the tavern of like a, a D&D campaign. It's like where you go and you sign up for a hunt, and then you'll see other hunters like hanging out, and like you can sit at a bench and... like do a stupid drinking animation or something um so that was where you'd kind of see other people in terms of the hunt space it is instanced so only you know it will be your hunt that is ongoing in that area at that time the thing this game does add is you can call in co-op help at any point during a hunt so whereas in the previous games you would have to go to the guild hall meet up with your party get them all to sign up to the correct for that one hunt and then go out together in a party um in this one you can as you are out there you can shoot up a flare and essentially that will then open your game to to uh for additional players to come in like and the then that <clears throat> like the bell in the souls games or blood yeah 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 games. so it's like putting down your summon sign in the soul game but they, i think it really just opens up so anyone else can then go sort of match make or something and it'll go into a world which has flared up essentially um and i think you can invite friends specifically as well at any point so it's it's more drop in drop out for whether or not you're playing with or without a party and is it that the same for free roam as well i don't know i presume so yeah okay i presume you can go out and just you know hang out in the in the wilderness on in a group so having kind of had at a decent portion of the game now yeah like what what are you hoping for in like the in the complete version when we get it in in how long is it now uh end of january so january 26th i think so just Mm -hmm. over a month um thing i the thing is is it's doing so much right like if i spoke about what i wanted out of monster hunter you know 10 years ago it would have been something like this like having monsters be able to interact and they've got a really interesting talk i think it was from comic con last year where they talk about the development of the ecology and so these monsters have designed aspects to them that uh that facilitates the way they live in that environment so there's one of the first monsters you fight is this thing it's called the jake uh, the great jagras and it's this this big lizardy thing 
and like it's got some like little lizardy things that follow it around and like they're like it's babies or something but like if it gets injured it'll go and eat something so it'll go eat like a big monster and it'll like swell up its belly like a toad and and then that is how it'll go recover but then it's like this big fat thing it's huge like because it's got this thing inside of it but then also it'll go back to its like little hovel and feed its babies with it it'll like regurgitate it and its little babies will like come and eat um so i think it's having these kind of improvements is like super awesome for monster hunter like allowing the monsters to sort of become more than just the the target for those hunts is is really cool because they're so well designed and they're so well animated and this game has improved the animations like significantly further than they were but they were great anyway even on psp um what i want from it is selfishly i'd want quite a few of the classic monsters to return there's only been a few shown off so like i look forward to seeing them like fighting the rathalos in this game was cool because seeing how it fights differently was was nice for someone like me um the thing that is most rewarding in monster is your own progression is the the progression of your weapons getting up to that you know in getting leveling up that sort of that particular weapon up to a certain degree is is really rewarding and having that new set of armor complete is really really rewarding um the thing i would want is i want it to be less of a grind um in the game i played there were things like five percent drop rates on some of the rarer the rarer items from a particular monster <clears throat> so the rathalos in in freedom unite which is the one on psp it had like a five percent or two percent drop rate on different for like carving out something called a Rathalos Ruby, which is just like the rarest part of a Rathalos, and you need that for like for the for the to complete building the the armor set. And so like that kind of stuff's a bit bullshit. And Monster Hunter does have cool ways of sort of alleviating that. So you can chop the tail off, and chopping the tail off gives you an additional part of the monster to carve, if that makes sense. And then carving is where you you get a number of carves off a given monster. So if you chop its tail off, you get an additional carve. So it gives you an additional chance. It'd still be those nice if it, was a, if it was more respectful of your time. Yeah, definitely. And I think, I think giving things like that. So like, if you chop the tail off and you carve the tail, it would be cool to reward you with the tail, like as a guaranteed carve. Like it sometimes doesn't. So mm. it, it's like it would be cool if there were more ways you could specifically damage a monster in order to guarantee uh material reward if that makes sense so like mm -hmm. you could break the claws you can break the face these are these are things you could always do in monster Hunter, and these would increase your chances of getting particular calves but it'd be nice if they sort of more guaranteed getting particular uh materials i think that would be nice um i have heard they did improve this kind of thing in the later games i think if you acquire enough material from a given monster like the different materials have different values so you could almost I think you could circumvent some of the rarer items by just having high quantities of other items. <laughs> um, and so I'm not 100% sure how that works, but I I look forward to seeing that, and hopefully it's not as much of a grind. The things the other games have been super guilty of before is also having really, really, really dull 10, 20 mission tutorial kind of stuff, like where it's like, oh, go out and collect mushrooms. Oh, go out and kill five of the really crappy monsters that nobody cares about um and they're just really boring so like so, i don't then, think they're going to be in this because of the open world collecting resources. and surely gathering. that you've had that equivalent in the beta already like it must be some of the opening of the game so uh perhaps one would but hope. just some some of the missions are literally go out and collect 10 blue mushrooms <laughs> and so you have to do the whole collect the mission go out load into the level run around the entire environment because you know, you can't collect 10 in the first area, so you've got to go all around and collect them all and then run all the way back to camp and hand in your, your completed quest. <laughs> and so, like, some of the game, I think some of them, like, have, like, yeah, like, 20 quests, which are just kind of bullshit like that, where it's like, oh, go out and kill 10 of the weakest enemy in the game and then come back. Um, it'd be nice if they shorten that. Mm. They shorten the time it takes to get to the good stuff because I think that's where most people quit because they go this is all a bit bullshit and then they get to their first like proper quest and it's quite hard and then they don't win and it's like nah, okay i just can't really be bothered like that's def that's exactly what i did with the very first monster hunter game on ps2 
is I went through all this stuff and then got to an actual monster and like I wasn't good enough like I couldn't and I couldn't beat it I couldn't figure out at the time and so I just I just gave up I was like I won't bother um so I I hope they've in the ways they are improving the game to appeal to more people in order to lower that barrier of entry I hope there is also a way in which they've done that taste my game face interestingly kind of Talking about Monster Hunters reminded me of um, a game that I had a little peek at pretty recently as well. So um, I chatted to someone on Discord, in point of fact, and um, they're a podcast listener, so um, hopefully they hear this. Um, And um, they uh, sent me a video of um, a game that Crytek's making at the moment. Really confused about Crytek, thought they'd gone under, but apparently a bit of them still exists. I think they've got various different studios or had various different studios. And this game was being made by one of them that went under and has now been kind of <laughs> rebirthed as a kind of sort of a contender for for punk bat for um player unknowns battlegrounds a bit of a um battle royale affair and it's called hunt showdown and it looks really interesting because instead of trying to directly do battle with um punk bat and um fortnite um they've got their own twist on this so um watching this video what i saw was a game that is about having small teams of players navigating a sort of um, daisy esque space where there's where it's populated by AI enemies, and they're doing that to try and find one big beast um, and banish it back to the hell from whence it came. Um, but they have to follow a series of clues to kind of uh, shrink the area in which that beast might be down. Um, So it's a big map and they're kind of going through a process of steps to make that area, the area that they should be looking in smaller and smaller whilst trying to avoid some more kind of minion like AI and to not alert the other players to where they are because they might turn up and try and kill them. So there's a lot going on in what actually looks like works very well as a, a versus multiplayer affair, but the largest part of it or at least the majority of um the time playing it is not spent in battle with other players um yeah i thought it looked really cool i thought it looked like a kind of multiplayer stalker that i kind of wanted mm. what did you think guys i i was actually really really far from sold on it um from what i saw in the trailer um like uh, all of the steps running towards it felt a little bit contrived to me and i know i've only seen one playthrough mm-hmm. um but yeah it felt like i don't know um it all felt i understand that video games by it generally are a little bit arbitrary but it felt particularly arbitrary it was just like do these things now do this thing and there are people and there are not people and there is ai and there is not ai and that's not important and that is not important i don't know um, yeah, I couldn't, when I was watching it, I couldn't really get a feel for an idea of, I guess, a drive beyond the fact of there being indicators on the screen to tell you to do stuff. Um, mm. And sometimes, like, I mean, um, the thing that it sort of, the two things that it reminded me of that um, I now want to play instead of that <laughs> are um, <laughs> uh, Left for Dead and Factions. So Left 4 Dead with this sort of like, yeah, you know, this co-op hoardy thing that where there is a genuine sort of mission and purpose and there's this constant sort of like panic and threat. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously factions, this sort of like the, team-based... The, this is the Last of Us multiplayer. Yeah, the Last of Us multiplayer. This, I, the, you know, this team-based uh, sort of like, yeah, okay, it's it's just kind of simply score-based or whatever. But, but it's a the, bit of a desperate every, struggle. Yeah, everything... Fi- yeah, the struggle feels real. It feels like, I, I don't know, like I, I would... In that scenario, I would just go, you know what, let's fuck this off and have tea. Um, <laughs> and yeah, some, sometimes I need that. I, I don't know. I need to get a feeling that this is something that I would be doing in that scenario. Do you know what I mean? But it's a multiplayer game. But also, I felt like for a multiplayer game, it had way more atmosphere that seemed tangible and appreciable through the gameplay than I would normally expect. And I feel that not really having played any of these new kind of open world arena survival shooters like um, Player Unknown's Battlegrounds, but it feels like that is what makes those appealing. And this could be something that's like that, but with a twisted supernatural edge do you know what what Mm. i saw of it actually i was like 
the other players are a bit of a like a bit of an additional add on that's not really required. It was the multiplayer element that really pulled me away from it. If there was this kind of like, oh, you are these guys and you're tasked with just getting this stuff out. And it's like, well, hang on, there's all these other, like, you know what I mean? There's these demons and you have to banish these demons. And then it's like, you know, you're saving your city in this weird sort of like old horror-esque sort of scenario. But instead, there's all of these other people that want to do it. Fuck why, it. But also, why are they not working together? Yeah, just let them at it. <laughs> yeah. like, if they really want it, just go for it. This, I mean, this I've is great. I've got a giant spider living in my barn. All right, well, we're going to stand outside and shoot each other to death. And then whoever's the last man standing gets to go in. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, yeah, but I mean... Yeah, the, exactly. But, but the difficulty of coming up with an excuse for why that happens is like such a minor thing. I'm sure they can contrive something along the lines of the, these different hunters are trying to do it so that they can gain more of a connection. Sure the forces of darkness <laughs> so that they can send more things back to hell or something but yeah they i get some money from satan <laughs> well yeah i go. think it looks cool good yeah <laughs> i was feeling like i was having to defend it quite a lot then i think it looks cool but i like i, I mean like i like shooting monsters with old guns and, um, <laughs> and, they, and that's the thing that i enjoy and i think it's like i and i like um i liked the um design of the beast it was this kind of skittering spiderling mm. running around on the ceiling of a barn, like all over the place, running away to hide and trying to recoup itself and stuff. Reminded me a little bit of, um, uh, you know, uh, what was that? What was that? Evolve. <laughs> yeah. A little bit. Like, um, but that's I, an interesting thing, though. Because that was a player controlled AI. Maybe that would be something that would also be good. Oh, yeah, but it didn't work in Evolve, did it? Yeah, but that's because well, Evolve shafted itself by being the, um, you know, uh, the 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 flag bearer for all of the terrible things that video games do now, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, mm. yeah. But I mean, I guess I guess that's the thing, though, right? Because I looked at that and I thought this maybe could be an evolve that worked uh, or works. Because um, evolve had um, asymmetric multiplayer, like one person playing as the beast, everybody else playing together to try and take down that beast. But in this case, the beast is not player controlled; it's AI. But then there's other players that are trying to vie for that same goal. And I I don't know, it's interesting to have players working in teams but against each other and having AI in there too. I mean, that's that's what's made MOBAs so popular, right? Like I think we should have that in more different game spaces. I think it's mm. I think it will be interesting to see how that pans out. And I know there's a few games that have attempted it, but I am yet to kind of get stuck into any of them myself. So yeah, um, this I, might be the one. I think. Possibly. I think for this game to have long-lasting appeal, I think the the tension you'll get from uh, the dread of other players being around will will be a good thing to keep it interesting. But I think if it's monsters aren't diverse and interesting to fight. Like if like if everything is just go into this house and chase it round and shoot it a lot, that that I don't think that'll be very fun. Like I think you'll need to have things maybe that move that don't stay in the same place. Maybe they hunt you. Um, have if the hunter becomes the hunter exactly. Yes, like like have course. something that is a predator monster that isn't just hiding in that house. That so you figure out it's there. You have to follow it. Like and maybe you'll come across, you know, one of the groups of people that it's just massacred that kind of thing i think i think you need to make sure you're really you're really milking the the rewards of setting it in that kind of setting like See? use use those use those demons to the full ability that they offer you i hear you dan but i don't think that's what makes a gives a multiplayer game longevity I think that it really comes down to the mechanics and the balance and the the little things working right that after you've been playing a game for tens, dozens, hundreds of hours, mm. that if they still feel good that you will be able to keep playing. And I think that with as as much as much time as people spend playing multiplayer games, that making sure that each kind of little moment of it is is crafted in its own weird way so that you're surprised by it cannot it can't lost for yeah, that yeah. long i suppose so. i suppose i'm not somebody who gets into multiplayer games so i'm talking what? about it from like if i played that hunt i wouldn't 
really be interested in playing it more than a couple more times. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, like if there's not more to compel me to go and try that new flavor that it's also got, like I, I, it wouldn't. I don't know. I I think I would struggle to stick with it a lot, especially if all if all three of them ended up being like say there's like oh what four different monsters if they all ended up I'll oh, go to the barn and shoot it because at that point you may as well not have a monster. I mean I I agree with you on that point, Dan. Like I often like thought, like I mean my experience with Left for Dead was playing through those scenarios a couple of times until I felt that I beat beat them, yeah. and then there wasn't really that much there for me to to do because I'd experience what I wanted from it and I think there are things for like the different levels of approach because I've never been one mm. for stats statistics and finite shooting mechanics I'm there for the theatre of multiplayer but the yeah, theatre yeah. of multiplayer it doesn't come from the scenarios you're in it comes from the people you're playing against like I played the absolute death out of Left 4 Dead like and the great thing about that was having a group of people of varying skill trying to make their way through this hostile environment and you never know quite who's just gonna go off the rails and do something that's completely inappropriate and you have to pull it back together and like even though the scenario itself is familiar the little things that can change within that mean that it's always drama there's always tension and I I feel like I feel like there is the potential to create something like that with this particular game. Um, what was it called again? Um, Hunt Showdown. But <laughs> it all name. depends. Yeah, awful name, awful name. Yeah. But it does all <laughs> depend on like how well they can pull in those those kind of key mechanical bits and pieces. And yeah. If, I mean, it's it's Crytek doing it, and like we've seen them do some some brilliant things in games and some less interesting things in games. So it's hard to know whether it'll be whether it will turn out to be good or not or what but i i will be following it now uh, after having had this look at it i i'd like i like anything with a with a bit of a stalkery vibe i suppose there's something about that kind of desolate wasteland even if it's uh not populated by mutants but strange uh beasts from nether dimensions that <laughs> i'm taking shots at like i'm i'm down for a bit of that i just hope i get to like score some some like holy symbols into my bullets before i fire them into the, the, the heads of the zombies of that world that'd be great <laughs> yep <laughs> i want there to be i want there to be a bible weapon <laughs> or like call of juarez <laughs> i just if i can just beat some zombies to death with the bible that'd be great <laughs> i was more thinking like a priest character where you literally just read it and like the thing recoils in in like if like if like one of injury. the tasks that you have to go through before you find the monster is discovering its true name, that would be delicious. <laughs> and then Call everyone with mics have to actually shout it out. <laughs> <laughs> I can just imagine a bunch of Geordies getting really pissed off at it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, of course, of course. But hey, no, but it's being made in Germany, so it won't have that annoying thing of it, them assuming that everybody that's um, talking to their their connect has to be talking with an American. American accent. <laughs> no, instead it'll be Hochdeutsch. It's the uh, the Swiss will be the ones pissed off instead. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, uh, um, so Wayne, you have well, in fact, it was a podcast before last that you were last on. We didn't have time to talk about something that you were quite excited about then, and you still haven't told us about it. So inform us what what kind of beautiful thing is is data wing so yeah um it's um one in our occasional series of uh, mobile games um i think it originally came out um on the on apple on the iStore ios or whatever it is that they call it these days um and is on android now i don't know how long it's been there i've only just recently stumbled across it um but it's um it's actually free or at least, yeah, um, free, no ads, no nothing. It's sort of a labour of love. Someone just liked it, liked what they were doing with it and stuck it out there for the world to do. And they're living off kind of related merchandise sales instead, which is quite <laughs> a nice idea. Um, but um, the game itself is, I guess, like it handles um, and the sort of core approach is a lot like a racing game. Um, you play an arrow and this arrow is constantly thrusting in the direction that it's pointing. Um, and by tapping on the left or right of the screen, you rotate it either counterclockwise or clockwise. Um, and so you get put into these tracks and the sort of conceit is that you're transmitting data. You're living inside a computer and this little arrow that you're controlling 
uh, I think they call you triangle actually rather than arrow you know they um is to um yeah is to ferry data from one point to another along these tracks so hold on is this is this a 3d or a 2d 2d okay so, you, so you're kind of you're looking top down and then the tracks are sort of micro machine style but the tracks are mostly like walled in and if you point the thruster towards a wall like the back of you is pointing towards a wall it sort of boosts you um so there's this um it's like sort of really mechanically smooth um the tracks are designed in such a way that they have like these big arcing corners that you sort of like swing and point like slightly tangentially to or whatever so you're almost power sliding yeah exactly you're different... power sliding along the sort of outside wall of a corner and boost off it and then look for your intersect with the similar swoop on the next corner and then as it goes on it adds other things like a sort of gravity that drags you towards the bottom so you have to carefully use your boost or other obstacles that um you know maybe spinning or whatever that you have to get around and then there's occasionally boost pads as well that act as if you're always facing with your back to a wall mm -hmm. so um, do you not propel do you not propel if you're just boosting without pointing at a wall you do but it's a lot faster okay um uh, it's like a sort of speed boost it yeah um it's almost like yeah you get that kind of double thrust if you will if you're mm -hmm. up against the wall but it varies depending on the angle as well if you're sort of very shallow against the wall then it's uh quite a subtle effect and if you're quite strongly against the wall it's quite a major effect but obviously you can't hold that for very long you just boost away from the wall and smash into the opposite one which <laughs> happens um just yeah worryingly often but um but around it so this is this it's got this sort of core mechanics of a racing game and, and often it sort of drops into this basic racing game style some of the modes are like sort of time trial laps or um you know do one lap in terms of this do three laps in this sort of time etc some of them are called skirmish where you race against a bunch of ai opponents and um and some of them are just point to point where the less the levels get a little bit more convoluted um and so far so great but what's so charming about this is the package that it's all thrown together in so i mean i'm i'm quite sold already i have to say mechanically it is delightful and it gets like a couple of extra bonus points from the way that it's all put together so you're because you are this sort of thing ferrying data you are in conversation well not conversation you are you know the freeman style just uh yeah like silent protagonist um, but you are told or spoken to by the OS of the computer who sort of like comes along as this kind of emoji style character. Um, but like old school emoji, like sort of squarey ASCII emoji style character um, who will say, you know, talk to you about like why you're doing it and what you're doing. And as it and as it develops, it turns out that this OS is and I don't want to go too far into it, but as it go, grows on, this OS is like it's like an AI that is sort of developing its own little emotions. And so you get this sort of like interaction outside of the levels where there's this kind of story and the story then sort of grows to not just be what's going on with this os inside the machine but it's influencing and you get a feel of this through like little things that pop up during the level influencing the world outside so you're also getting a feel for a story that is happening completely outside of the confines of the game that you're currently playing hmm. and so there's this like so there's this like constant drive to sort of keep going and see what's going to happen in all of these different very simply expressed but very heartfelt plot lines that are all like yeah that have like they've just they're just really nicely tidily executed it's not overbearing it's not like too much it's not it doesn't feel plastered on even it, it, it even though the ideas are quite disparate the way that it's put together makes it feel quite natural and complete and um yeah when you um for certain levels as well there's like um certain stretch goals so you might complete a level once and then it'll go ah you've done this now do it now do it better now do it better now do it better 
So there's there's a replayability to a number of the levels as well that like really helps you with working with the mechanics of it. Mm -hmm. If Hmm. no, sorry. So I guess the if you've got like a separate narrative going on, just going back to that point, I I think it's quite a difficult thing to manage a balance right in a game. I think that there's a few that attempt to do it. Um, I think um, oh, what the hell's a particular name of the game that I'm thinking of? Oh well, well there are there are lots of uh, instances where it's attempted and to varying degrees of success and i think it's hard to get the player to buy into the story that's going on that they're not really a part of i think a lot of that comes down to the quality of the writing and how much they actually are interacting with the the pieces of that story even if it isn't something that they're driving themselves so what's what's interesting about it is that the like you are this like you're uh, not just a sort of um voiceless protagonist but um actually completely stoic right the idea is that you don't care you simply have these missions these things that you are doing and it all happens around you Mm -hmm. and that really helps towards it it's not just like i mean like the obvious sort of example of this um obviously this is not quite to that standard but of the same thing done well your uncharted fours or your last of us or your resident evils you know where you're seeing the letters and stuff of a story that's gone previously or something like that and the thing that Mm. really makes a difference there is that the writing is actually good enough to carry it yes and that's that's what it is the writing's all very believable very realistic well um when i say realistic obviously it's a little bit of a you know strange concept so realistic may not be the word but well the external world one is quite realistic and like it's a subtle and simple story that is just engrossing enough that you want to know what's going on there whereas the internal one is a little bit more you know sideways with a bit more of a joke and a smirk and mm-hmm. well, it sounds you- a bit like portal to me uh, yeah i mean like i say so this is a game that um that you can like i mean you can do the whole thing in a couple of hours it's not got that sort of like elaborate depth to it but like mm. i say it's like for a free mobile game it's such a wonderful tidy package so joe you was going to have a question as well oh no i was just saying that one of the things you were saying that sounded interesting which i think helps all these these sort of things is um the the the, the external storyline does it did you saying it informs the gameplay a little bit no no it invented, no no, no not but look, in the way that so it's only, not reflected in the... when i say it so it does but for a very subtle reason if that makes sense they are connected um and it's clear that they are connected but what's happening outside doesn't really influence inside but what's happening inside is going to affect outside if you don't do what you're doing oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's like I say, it's, it, but I mean, for it's like I say, it's a small free package that, and I mean, it looks, it looks gorgeous as well. It's very simple, like simple wireframey vector stuff um, is the entire aesthetic, but it's got this like um, almost, I guess, some um, Sonic Mania style, graphic overlay that you can turn off if your phone can't hack Hmm. it but Hmm. that sort of gives it this kind of old school almost like vcse kind of feel you know so yeah Yeah. i just everything okay yeah yeah so it's bringing some retro flow ascii art and wireframe with a yeah yeah, vhs overlay yeah all right Uh, yeah i'm (laughs) It sounds good. It, it sounds great, yeah, and it's it free. Does, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I yeah. think I might grab that. So, yeah. Data Wing is Data what it was Wing, called. it's called, yeah. and yeah, it's absolutely fantastic and really highly recommended. Cool. I think I think I'll be checking that out as well. Mm. Okay. Um, in that case, I think we're going to go to an email from a reader. I'm so, sorry, a what? <laughs> <laughs> a listener. That's what I meant to say. Um, I, I just meant I couldn't believe we have an email. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, oh, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I was following along that line as well. Given that the only person to mail us so far is Z. <laughs> <laughs> but, hey, all right. So uh, I think I think Wayne, you're going to do the honors, right? Yeah, sure. Um, okay, so we'll do this one in two parts, right? Because there's two quite yeah. distinct um, flavors going on here. 
Um, so um, thank you, Chris K, for writing into us. So I will read the um, top bit first. So, hey, guys, just lis- finished listening to episode 65 and really enjoyed your discussion on how people view and play video games. This year, I've had some particularly difficult times that resulted in having a lot of free time. And I found that video games really helped me both escape from reality, but also give me more confidence in actually dealing with reality due to the sense of accomplishment you can get from completing a mission, as well as giving you a bit of a break and some headspace. Dishonored in particular was great at it, um, as it was the first time I've ever really learned to stealth in a game. And the time and patience that took was super relaxing and really fun. It was also the first time I really tried to embody a character and this escapism was brilliant and really helped clear my mind and helped me focus on more positive and less depressing things. More recently, Wolfenstein New Colossus has been great for taking out some uni stress because there's nothing more relaxing than beaming a KKK member in half. Uh, (laughs) These two instances have really helped me appreciate and understand video games a lot more and how useful they can be for me. Um, Your podcast has also helped with my understanding and appreciation of video games, so keep up the good work. All right. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so if first so, of all, I'm going to say if you want to send us an email, it's tastemygameface at gmail.com. Um, but yeah, I think this is really interesting because it's, um, I mean, we had this conversation last episode about kind of our changing approach to video games and how we are differently using them as a way to, way to escape and stress relief as well as our kind of normal approach of just wanting them for the experience of narrative and of the art but um mm. you've got someone here who is kind of finding that the process of putting themselves more in that world of like embodying the character is helping them escape more and more i think that's kind of a little bit in contrast to what we were discussing last episode that we felt that it took energy to really kind of give out all to a game and therefore mm. that trying to find some meditative escape needed something that was less narrative based, less about kind of putting ourselves in the headspace of those characters. Yeah, I, 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 I quite like the idea of like sort of going into the headspace or trying to embody characters that are part of games that are quite strongly plot character plot driven. Um, because the idea, like, I, I find that quite difficult for me. It's always something that is happening to another entity and I am observing this. Um, even some of the best story games that I've ever played are, one, like, I never really feel like I am inside that character. Whereas things, I guess um, one counter example has already been mentioned is Portal, where, you know, it's that you are that sort of voiceless, faceless protagonist. So you are f- a little bit more, it feels like it's happening to you. Mm. Um, which but, is of course the aim of having the yeah, the kind of voiceless but i do like i find that i do that a lot more on more i guess um games where it seems less likely that you would do that sort of like uh sports games or um like i think um yeah like uh going all the way back to speedball or things like um Always. steep or steep or ssx tricky or stuff like that even though there are quite crazy characters there i feel like it's more me in the moment so the question is Mm. then as as an experience of video gaming as a way to kind of get away from the real world a little bit do you do you find that that experience is one that allows you to chill out and kind of ground yourself a little bit more than when you are playing something that's that is narrative focused and therefore you don't feel like you're embodying the character as much i think it all depends i think it all depends on the narrative actually when we're talking about because i know that like the idea of this sort of headspace and focus and stuff like things like i couldn't for example go through an episode of life is strange if i was feeling quite uh, mentally taxed already you know Mm. there's quite it feels like even though obviously it's very easy to just nip back in time by a couple of seconds and try again, everything feels like it has gravitas. It has consequence. Mm. And when I'm not in a, when I'm in a position that something has that sort of level of consequence, those are the things that I try to avoid. Um, whereas, yeah, things like uh, score based stuff or sports based stuff would be sort sort of more my retreat. And then that element of um, self. Um, that element of like success as well for escapism, the idea that you're giving yourself to a puzzle, a problem, a concept and are just completing at that where there is perhaps less consequence if things go wrong. 
um, is obviously that's a little bit more where I would go for things like that. Okay, so maybe the more puzzle game you get to finish a task thing that that I often go for for that chill that space. I think Dishonored is quite an interesting pick for it because it's, and I think maybe that's why it works for the way that he's describing it because, um, it's a game that gives you a lot of options in how you tackle it. So if you choose to embody that character in a certain way and make decisions in a certain way it's the kind of game that allows you to do that in the gameplay as well as in the maybe some of the more direct dialogue choices it's a game that you can decide how you want to play it and it will let you play it that way and so i think maybe in that way your role playing that character is rewarded in a game like that that isn't necessarily the case for all games but it's also nice because you can put your own kind of parameters onto it, right? Mm-hmm. So, so you know, you've got your own restrictions. You've got your own ways of telling that particular story and it can be whatever you want it to be. See, mm-hmm. for me, one of the things in my life recently is I've been, um, I spent quite a lot of time in hospital because a loved one was quite sick and I didn't really know what to play or, but I knew I had to do a lot of sitting on a plastic chair. <laughs> so I decided that... Um, I pick up my 3DS and uh, play Ocarina of Time, The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, because it's going to be 20 next year. Cool. That's depressing. <laughs> but um, I've, And, uh, you know, with Breath of the Wild out, I thought it'd be a nice kind of touchstone to kind of get involved in. Because I felt that like I could never, re- I couldn't really push myself further in anything like any untrodden ground. I wasn't mm. going to take it in. I was too stre- stressed. I needed like a sleeping bag to kind of climb inside, you know, that I'm completely familiar with. There's somewhat of a, you know, a kind of safe space, mm. I suppose. A comfort game. A com- yeah, a comfort game. And it's I- and like, I haven't played it for, uh, I mean, 11, 11 years. But it's interesting, you know, your mind starts filling in the blanks. Mm. You know, as you're, as you're going along and you're kind of like, oh, I, I, I remember this. And I don't have to think. Mm. You know, I know where most of the whole pieces are. I know where most of those <laughs> stupid fucking sculptures live. Yeah, I, think, I, know. I think there's quite a difference with games in narrative immersion and world immersion. And I think once you've gone through the narrative of a game, you're the reason you're going back is for that vibe. Like you're going back for that vibe. So I think I think losing yourself in a game maybe is taxing narratively if you've not experienced it before or in games where that is required. But if you go to a game that doesn't necessarily require the narrative immersion but does have environmental immersion or a game that you've played before, I think that is what can be quite comforting. And that's why people play Skyrim for fucking ever. <laughs> exactly. Or even something like, like didn't play it much, but like something like No Man's Sky didn't no, ask well, that much of you, but it was... It was well, quite was, an experiential exploration thing, which was quite yeah. a pleasant thing. That was the promise of No Man's Sky that didn't that it didn't quite manage to deliver on, or at least that was the impression that I got from the outside that there was going to be a kind of chilled escapism of exploration. That I think been... it still had that in some ways. I think maybe just people were putting too much on it. Like, but the, mm. but just the it does offer. You know, if you land on a cool looking planet, like it is quite. In, there's not much. You know, it's not going to keep you entertained for long. But there is that sense of oh wow, everything's really big. <laughs> and like and it like looks quite nice and it's all quiet and yeah i could i can sit here for a bit <laughs> dan, dan would get on lovely with a magnifying glass i think <laughs> <laughs> but um small and far away <laughs> i mean what, is, what would like sort of like you mentioned comfort games i want to like call out a couple of mine because like where you these sort of like places i retreat to like one like i've talked about most of them on here at some point in the past right um like i will go to um kerbal space program for the idea of the six the consequenceless success idea because everything can be restarted very easily but when you do something right and it works there is uh, almost no finer feeling um because of just how difficult hard it, is it is to do things in yeah, space yeah exactly um <laughs> But then, um, like, a couple of music-led games as well. So um, Amplitude I talked about at length a little while ago. And please, 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 Harmonics, give me an expansion, please. <laughs> um, and um, also a game on the PS3 called um, Chime, I believe. And you've spent a lot of time playing that with me. Yeah. Um, and this is a sort of wonderful switch-off, like, you know, music puzzler that, yeah, you can, like, you get that sort of, like 
when you get hit your flow, you, you can feel completely immersed in it, even though it's so abstract. And I think that idea of like, as you like, um, Dan, although it's a very different concept, mm. that idea of world immersion, like in a very abstract environment is what comes to the fore with that one, because the sort of the visuals, the music all tie in very nicely together and you reach this flow state where you are kind of in it. Mm. Um, Mm-hmm. Yeah, and like everything else is gone. Yeah. Because I have that with uh, shmups. You know, you're scrolling shmups. There comes a moment after I've been playing for about four minutes where the entire rest of the experience of the world around me melts away. And it's just me and the tiny spaceship moving <laughs> in and out of millions of bullets. And I'm pretty sure my eyes are crossed. And, yeah, I'm yeah, dribbling, yeah. and I'm dribbling a little bit. And and that moment where come, someone comes and taps you is to arouse you from it can be quite a distressing and jarring yeah, experience. Really can. No, I'm playing mish mops. <laughs> I guess or it's, that, it's the... that point where you think about it, where you, yeah. you, oh. you, you, like, you sort of take yourself out of it for a second and think about it, and then you're like, oh, no, I've, I've, I've flicked the spinning top here. Yeah. <laughs> like, this was very finely balanced, and now I'm doing everything I can to hold on to it. And then at that point, you're bound to just, everything's bound to fall apart. But <laughs> yeah. I guess this is the point in the episode where I mentioned Titanfall 2 again, and I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> so, you. but yeah, but flow, <laughs> flow state is a really, really important part of video games for me as well. Um, mm. I think, I think maybe in this kind of escapism stuff, like, I feel like that flow state thing is not the thing that's kind of bringing me to a chilled level that like maybe this more finding that space between escapism that involves actually putting energy in and just being able to chill out like um Mm. the more open world games type things are the things that are doing that for me more lately i'm kind of going back to horizon is scratching that itch um but yeah but i i mean i do love a good multiplayer first person shooter so it's (laughs) it's definitely a vibe i've thought of an (laughs) example quite similar to yours joe um I remember getting Black Flag at a point in time when I was just a bit, like, feeling a bit crap. And, like, I remember just sinking ages into that. And it's that's the kind of game that is very... That gameplay loop is very repetitive. But it's also just fun. It's a nice place to be in. It was, like, winter when I got it. So, like, I'm... Instead of being it all, like, cold and drab outside, I was, you know, sailing across the Caribbean. And it's very... It, it's got quite quite uh well-mannered audio design like it it allows you to listen to the wind on the open ocean and it's got your you know your crew singing and stuff so that was quite a a pleasant game to immerse myself in to just run through that gameplay loop a number of times and the story is a bit shit so like that didn't matter (laughs) yeah yeah no it's a it's a it's an it's i had a very similar like experience with it because i think i picked it up straight with my um playstation 4 it was one of the two games that i had for a little while and i remember just got kind of getting all encompassedly like sucked into all of the superfluous ubisoft content in that one more like particularly because yeah, yeah. there was something about the crystal clear water and how like poppingly colorful like the jungles and stuff were yeah that really i don't know just made me kind of want to chill out yeah. there and just being on the boat, just being able to jump off the boat, being in the water, climbing back on your boat, like was such an easy. There were like no barriers to just yeah to do that next be a bit thing. Of an arsehole at points. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tropical islands and pirates, though, right? Like, just there's 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 something there, mm. right? We should finish the rest yeah. of this email okay. anyway. So let's um have a look at. We've got a last little section here. Yeah. So um. So, uh, Chris has a question for the group. What are the best films based on video games? I've just watched the Assassin's Creed film and that left a lot to be desired. So, looking for some good recommendations. Doom. None. Done. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I, I think, yeah, Z, Z, Z has a winner, though. I think that I, it's hard to say that it's actually good in any genuine... It's the best. Doom in, is the best. In any... In, <laughs> Doom is Doom is great. Semper Fire, motherfucker. <laughs> so, right. So, it, it, if we are, what makes Doom amazing though is is how it embodies the video game rather than its 
underlying quality as a film. I feel right? completely yeah, it, differently. Um, no, <laughs> I, I agree with you when because the thing is, is there is a spirit, there is an essence that exists around Doom, which is one of the reasons why Doom had such a hard time up until last year making a sequel. Yeah, you know, it's in the air, like, but it's quite hard to explain. But the film actually finds it. Yeah, yeah, and no, no. holds it, and and it never let it never lets Puts go. It in a bowl, and it's yeah. fantastic. It really is for that. I consider, consider my mind changed. Actually, you're right. You're 100 percent right. <laughs> that I, it's just that it doesn't it doesn't seem like it's trying to like be the video game in any like really obvious ways, apart from you know those few minutes in yeah. it that are in first person. But it actually is fully rago in exactly the right way. <laughs> um, and and I love The Rock, and it's <laughs> it was the first film where I realised he was an amazing actor. <laughs> <laughs> and and everybody who says that he isn't is wrong. Just because he looks like an eighties action hero does not mean he doesn't know how to act. Pain and gain. <laughs> Pain, pain and game is so good as well. Um, I think Mortal Kombat is a That was good the film. only other one I was... No, I used to again, watch that I a lot. I disagree, but... I disagree. Your soul is mine! But, but I love it. Get like, I, again, I can't say it's a good film, but in terms of the question, best of this genre, Mortal Kombat mm. has to be held really highly in, in yeah, high Yeah, because it's much better than the Street Fighter film. <laughs> yeah, but it's not just much better than the Street Fighter film. It's much better than almost every other attempt at this sort of thing that's ever been done, right? I, it is I effectively... Watched, <laughs> I watched that long before I'd played a Mortal Kombat game, and I enjoyed it. I was contemporarily playing Mortal Kombat and being excited, at being excited about Mortal Kombat. Mm. And um, I remember I was, I was, I was too little. I was too little. <laughs> yeah. But a friend's yeah, dad took me to the cinema to go see it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a bit of an awakening. <laughs> mm. I, I was like, oh my god, they're kicking each other in the face a million times. This is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I, w- I want to talk about something in particular about the Mortal Kombat movies, right? Because like, there's a thing from like your friend circles, Joe, that I was introduced to like somewhere along the line after after we met <laughs> each other, which was the fact that in the second Mortal Kombat, the first thing that happens is one of the one of the characters gets killed off one of the mainstay characters of the first one Johnny Cage right yeah and now every time that a character dies right at the beginning of the sequel it's a Johnny Cage in yeah <laughs> so here's, here's the best thing though right there was there was the I think it's the guy that's done the Power Rangers shorts or something like that recently but he took Mortal Kombat and made a little YouTube short that ended up being a kind of series of uh, a short kind of TV series that was about Mortal Kombat characters. And the thing that happens at the beginning of the first one is Johnny Cage gets Johnny Cage. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> oh, yeah, that just... Oh, it, was, it was a special moment for me. It was a special moment. I think one of the really interesting film things about video game movies, though, is there's often been these kind of ones that... That all that almost was, you know, that that didn't get made. Like Alex fucking Garland wrote a script for a Halo movie. I know, a and, Neil, wrote, and Neil Bloomkamp was gonna direct it. Yeah, it was gonna be great. It was. Everything was there, but no, it all fell apart. It like too much money. And that, <laughs> yeah, and that and that happens. Unfortunately, we're we're entering into this kind of new time with it. Like so, the Assassin's Creed movie, I would say, is probably one of the, you know bigger punts actually the only one that i really see is costing a lot of money before was that jake gillenhall prince of persia film mm-hmm. which is which is family fun it's a, it's a bit of a, i mean it's family fun it's kind of all I've right never seen like, it. I, there's an interesting ostrich race yeah there. there's a great there's, there's a really not on ostrich race <laughs> in the middle of that <laughs> there's Dwarves a great riding there's, ostriches I, hey <laughs> bought your money no, I mean, Lily's there because of course he is let's, let's not miss around the whole film is kind of not on I yeah mean, it's super not on yeah. <laughs> that's the thing you have to like you have to kind of hang out at the door with Prince of Persia you kind of have to hang that out famous, at the door with all video famous, games movies <laughs> that famous yeah. Persian Jake Gyllenhaal yeah. <laughs> so I've thought I've thought of I've thought of one thing that is an actual video game adaptation and I've thought of another thing that is not but it it seems very inspired by video games and I want and both of these are actually good so like the first one is like the Netflix Castlevania is oh, really yeah. good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
definitely. And that's, so that's like a little, that, 100%. A, a little three episode short anime going to be a second season. And that was really great. Really I, ten, like really good atmosphere and really suited those characters, I thought. I can barely wait for more of that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, it was like, good. It's got me on such tender hooks, and I'm such a Castlevania fan. And watching like uh, such an abstraction as a NES game turned into a really in depth like mm. anime series is really interesting. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. how they're actually making it kind of play by play what happens in the gameplay of that game. It's mm. very interesting. Um, so that's one, and I think that is great. Um, the other one is, I think the raid is essentially a video game movie. Because it's essentially go it's through go, go through levels, fight mini bosses, fight the big boss. By you are physically climbing up levels of a tower. Yeah, but if we're doing that, Scott Pilgrim wins surely. I know, but Scott Scott Pilgrim is is a film about people who like who are. It's about people who grew up with video games, and it's yeah, obviously it's in inspired the style in its of, action of a video game. Yeah, it is uh, yeah, told, yeah, yeah, yeah. The plot okay, yeah. is a video game, like literally. It's like there are seven bosses. You must beat the it's seven. Like, there bosses. even is a video game. <laughs> yeah, and there yeah, is a I video see. game. Of it. I mean, it's essentially River City Ransom. Like that's <laughs> the, the 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 plot of it, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, yeah, but I, I don't but know. If we're talking about these kind of <laughs> level. <then> got... <laughs> these these kind of going up levels, ta- taking on more kind of fearsome difficulties in some sort of towering inferno. Then obviously dread winds. Yeah, but yeah, and, it's, and Dread, and, Dread, and, Dread and the Raid Henry, are like the same the film with one? different paint. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but like I mean, but Dread's Dread. Yeah, chins can. I kill. mean, I think the Raid is better than Dread. <laughs> oh, oh, I have such a hard time so with this difficult. whole conversation. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> but, but back to your point. Back to your point. Like, like then, like, does that make Hardcore Henry the best one? I don't know. Because it's seen just it. first person. Man runs around shooting. Yeah, but is yeah, it but is it good? good? Though? Yeah, no. <laughs> but it's the best representation of the no, but, great I mean, mechanics. We're, we're, like a good expression of a bottling of the concept of video games as opposed to simply an it's attempt at doing accurate... it and really fucking it up. But, like, it's, it's... but if it's Call of Duty that you're making the film of, then Hardcore Henry is an exceptionally good that I just don't want it. You know, it's, like one, of those, <laughs> it's one of those things. I think it's... The, the, one of the points I was trying to make earlier is that I think we're entering this really interesting time where certain developers are trying to expand out into this kind of movie sphere. And Assassin's Creed mm. is a lot of money. Yeah. Right? Like, and it did middlingly. It made its money back, didn't it? So they're thinking about doing a sequel. Now, Ubisoft also want to make a Splinter Cell movie. And they've said that Tom Hardy will play Sam Fisher, which I'm, I'm kind of into because I yeah, like yeah. Tom Hardy. But like... This the future of the video game movie seems to be something that is happening now. You know, we're gonna see that. Well, we had Warcraft we at, last year, like, and I I haven't seen it, but I actually, heard Warcraft is actually mixed things. Right. It's, it's possible. It's just got Travis Flimmore in it, hasn't it, from Vikings? Yeah, that mm. ridiculously I'm, handsome. No, man. he is a handsome fellow. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> um, I guess, but like, what we do get is lots of like. Actually, hold on, no, maybe maybe I've just thought of the winner here. I'm, I mean, I'm not sure if this counts, but but King of Kong I is that the one? It. So it's a documentary about trying to get the high score at, at Donkey Kong. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. it's brilliant. Um, I've heard, I've heard a lot about it. Mm-hmm. It it is exceptionally good. It is dwarfed by the Smash Brothers documentary. Which is just called the Smash the Brothers. The Smash Brothers, yeah, which is, which is which available is on, YouTube. on YouTube for free. And <laughs> it's a real big time investment, but is absolutely phenomenal piece of encapsulated time. Like it was it's very forward thinking. People like doing tournaments in their bed in their bedrooms, getting everyone from the states surrounding them into their one house, and they're having the foresight to capture these fights. On VHS, <laughs> so that later on they'd be there when someone decided they wanted to make a documentary about it. It's amazing <laughs> to me. And you get to That's watch cool. the, de- the development of, you know, people starting out playing a fighting game and then learning how to break it and then that changing the kind of battlefield that it, that it happens on. It's, it's a phenomenal film. And this is why mm. Tower 4 was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
But yeah, yeah. Um, but what I was going to say before I suddenly got sidetracked by that other thought about documentaries was that what we do get is lot. We're getting more and more films that are about not specific video games, but the but video game culture um, that are about pop culture, uh, pop culture of the time, or are trying to integrate that in some way. So we do have your your uh, Rick it Ralphs, and we do have um, Ready Player One that's coming out next year. Yeah, and unfortunately, um, things like Pixels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, wait, is that the Adam Sandler one? Yeah, yeah. It's like for 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 not me. It's like if you play video anyone. games and you're older than me and you like Adam Sandler movies. I don't know. Who there is no one in that. <laughs> 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 from from what I hear about Pixels, is it's a film for people who've seen video games, but who haven't necessarily ever put any time into actually enjoying the medium, but they know what they All are. Films. It's essentially that Facebook thing. It's essentially that Facebook post of Do you remember this? And everyone's like, oh, yeah, like, <laughs> like, <it's just laughs> that film. Yeah, 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 yeah that, that, that is true. But can I say that there is a very, very interesting thing that happens in smack bang in the middle of that, where the <laughs> okay. creator of Pac-Man himself, as himself. Have you seen this squared, movie? Yeah, me and Ellie did a masochistic <laughs> one about it. You know how we get on that thing sometimes. Why would you do that? Yeah, because we're, <clears throat> we're bad pricks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's confronted by Pac-Man. <laughs> and he tries to convince Pac-Man to stop. And he's like, my son. <laughs> and then Pac-Man eats him. And my meta everything exploded at that moment. <laughs> oh, that is great. <laughs> and so now you know that's in it, you really don't have to watch it. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, I'm kind of like a uh, proper trailer turned up for Ready Player One um, sometime last week I think and I've, mm. I've mentioned the book on the podcast before and I really rate it um, I think it's going to be really interesting to see how the film turns out um, I think it's so interested in the current state of video games that there's like loads of characters from current video games that are in it um, and I am worried that that's going to somewhat kind of take away from the incredibly 80s fueled vibe of the book but mm. you know it's a film of a book there's always got to be something that's wrong right I, don't I know. am, Lord of the Rings. I am very I... worried that that film is also going to be that Facebook post from watching that trailer yeah, but of the zeitgeist of now, I swear I saw a picture. It looks like Trace from Overwatch yep, is in it. Like, is. What the fuck? But also, man? that's just advertising but, bullshit. But also, so is the Iron Giant. So is the Iron. Uh, as in, like. As in the what, Iron like Giant. The as in, as in the, the Iron Giant played by Vin Diesel, Vin Diesel. in that film. Yeah. So like I, it's, po- it's pouring from lots game. of different different places. What are you places. talking about? I don't understand. I've lost the point. <laughs> is it about video games or is it about the fucking Iron Giant? I don't. It's what about are you talking every, about? It's about it's about all like a, nerd culture. But things. this is what I really like. I, I've heard good things about the book, but like that trailer really has me like. Oh, are you are you just gonna show everybody everything that they might remember and like yeah, the, uh, in me. order to it garner sounds... favor? Like it, mm. it sounds That's almost kind of interminable though. Like. I don't... <laughs> Is it is that good? I, I, so, I, but, this, but this is the thing, right? This was my whole weird experience of reading the book. Like, it's great, and then it kind of ends up being so consumed by its desire to be an ode to all pop culture of yore that, like, it loses its way for a while, and you're just like, oh my god, you're just talking about things from the 80s for no actual tangible plot reason and then it all comes back together at the end and you're like okay yeah, no but it's it going to be all what's popular though as well right so it's not like they're going to bust around one corner and there's going to be like abe from abe odyssey and he's going to be like mellow that's not going to happen and I'd, I'd love that i that, it, that'd get it me might, though it's, it's not going to do that oh like it's the, just that you're going to run around a corner and nathan drake's going to be like hey come with me if you want to live <laughs> I don't know why he's determined. Yeah, why would he do that? Yeah. I don't know. Because it, it, it's a blend of every pop culture reference at the yeah, same exactly. time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 75 yeah, yeah. minutes of just one character <laughs> saying another character's quotes. They're just queuing up. <laughs> they I, just mean, walk past. I mean, there's a significant amount of the book that kind of is that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so... just the conveyor belt of them coming past and doing that, and occasionally they get to <laughs> shake their hand, right? It's like the generation <laughs> game. <laughs> what I, I kind of s- hope is that they. Is that a they cuddly commit- toy! <laughs> <laughs> I I hope I kind of hope they commit to like some of the some of the intense parts of the book that like just won't work in film that they just have 
I don't know, like a full perfect game of joust in there or something like that. That that did that did really make me happy. <laughs> <laughs> But hey, all right. I I think we should probably call this a podcast because we've been going for a while now, folks. So um, if, unless anybody else is desperate to add something onto this like excellent little bit of <laughs> not video game but video game conversation we're having, <laughs> no, no, I'm good. Okay, I'm angry now. So let's call this. <laughs> <All right. laughs> so like, Chris, thanks for this excellent question. Obviously, yeah, thanks, we got Chris. a lot of a lot of maybe not good chat but like heated debate out of this so um yeah um i well actually no i'm gonna say this before i uh we sign off um if you have enjoyed this podcast please recommend this to a friend it's working we're getting more listeners we're very happy about that um if you would like to contact us like chris has you can email us at taste my game face at gmail.com or you can tweet us at taste my game face or you can find us on facebook or on our website just google taste my game face and i'm sure it'll turn up um we've also got um a few bits and pieces on YouTube that uh, might be worth checking out too. Um, and with all that in mind, I have been Azizi Adiemo. I've been Joe Knight. I've been Wayne James. And I've been Dan Lawson. And that was episode 66 of Taste My Game Face. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Taste My Game Face. Yeah.